will most assuredly become vile, to walk in the counsel of the ungodly is the first step towards standing in the way of sinners and sitting in the seat of this scornful. That is from Volume 4 of Testimonies, page 185. If you notice in our scripture, brethren, that the godly man's life is first described in negatives. Meaning that godly man is blessed on the things that he does not do. You read it there, it said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So he is described by a negative. The psalmist says that the person is blessed if he does not do one kind of thing, but instead do, does the other. And then the person who wants to be blessed <coughs> must not walk down the road of those who rebel against God, those who have no fear of God, and those who consider themselves above God's law. Instead, a person who wants to be blessed must live wisely in his relationship with God, delighting and meditating on God's word. When the word blessed is used in here, brethren, it comprehends material and spiritual blessing, both of which comes as a result of following God's way. Now, a person who is separated from the world will not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So, the advice for us that, or the counsel for us, that we must avoid the counsel of the wicked or ungodly. We must not live our life like the rest of the world. The word, in the New International Version, the word was used wicked rather than in place of the word ungodly. But I, I like the word wicked. It simply means the same thing. The word in the Hebrew, the, the word wicked in the Hebrew word is called rasya. And the root idea is that it means to be loose or unstable. This word carries two ideas there. That first, it means to be wicked is to be loose with morals. And it also means loose from God without Him as an anchor or controlling device. It refers to those who are controlled by their own desires, by their own emotions, and flesh rather than by the word of the Holy Spirit. We are to avoid counsel from those who doesn't have God as their anchor. And also, of course, the Bible says a lot on how we should walk. Psalm 143, verse 8, for example, the Bible says, we should ask God to show us how to walk. And Psalm 143, verse 8, the Bible says, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. You want to open your Bible to Psalm 143, verse 8? It says, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. And Psalm 86, verse 11, the Bible says, Teach me your way, O Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. That's the counsel for us how to walk the godly way. And in Ephesians chapter 4, you want to open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul has lots to say about walking in the Lord. Verse 1 and 2 it says, I therefore, Paul talking here, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to be walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And in verse 2 it says, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the love of your flesh. Now, I'd like to re-emphasize 
how we should not walk and how we should walk. We are not to walk in the counsel of the wicked, as our text says this morning. We are to ask God to show us how to walk. And the Bible tells us that we are to walk in love, in truth, and in spirit. And I know, and it's easier said than that, brethren, because it's not easy. It's not that easy to walk according to the scripture. You are with me? It's not that easy to walk according to the scripture. Why? Because it will take discipline, it will take commitment, it will take determination, it will take patience. And so I, I, I read that and I repeat it again that it's easier said than done. But it's not impossible because God will help us and show us how to walk. The person who is separated from the world will not stand in the way of sinners, as our text says. Sinners in the Hebrew was an archery term that meant to fall short or miss the mark, as it is used in this text in here. Now, the mark here, brethren, is the will of God. Sin the Bible says it's the transgression of God's law. And the Bible also says, Romans 3, 27, I believe, we are all sinners, so we have all missed the mark. That is why Christ had to die for our sins so that we might have His righteousness. Now, the word sinners again, in this text here, refers to those who have deliberately chosen a way of life, a path contrary to the will of God. The man of blessedness chooses to direct his life by God's will, and we should not stand in with these people and for their ideas. Let me repeat that. The man of blessedness chooses to direct his life by God's will, and we as believers, we should not stand with the people who are ungodly and hold and have their ideas. How should we stand? Psalm 33 verse 8 says, Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13, the Bible says, We should stand firm in the faith. And then in Philippians 1 verse 27 says, We should stand together with one mind and spirit. A person who is separated from the world will not sit in the seat of mockers. Now, the word sit, as you see it here, the word sit, as it used in this text, is, it means to dwell, or to remain, or abide. It emphasizes a settled state of or, or a settled state or condition. Now, I'm afraid that this is the state of majority even of the majority of the church. <coughs> the Gallup poll was made which compared the church and the uncertainty. It shows that it basically there is no difference in the way they live their lives. Now I'm talking about the church and the unchurched people. If there was a Gallup poll done and basically there's not much difference. In other words, We are falling into that category, although we are here in church. Now, mockers, as it's used in the international version, is a word that means to ridicule. It refers to the one who is actively engaged in putting down the things of God in his word. And what? how can mocking occur? Mocking can occur not only by declaration of word, but by declaration of a way of life. We can mock the word of God by just the way we live. I would even say, I would even dare to say that most of us here probably are mocking God's word. How do people mock the word of God? 
Number one, by blatant ridicule or rejection. A lot of people hear the word of God, hear it, hear it again and again and again, and yet they reject it. That is a form of mockery of the word of God. By listening to the word that is proclaimed, but then ignoring it. It's, in essence, we mark the word when we fail to obey and align our lives accordingly to the will of God. And so how do we avoid these things? How do we avoid these things? The answer is in this, in this verse here, next verse, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. A person who is saturated with the word of God, because his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, the person, the godly person, the object of his life is to delight in the word of God. Of course, the law, of course, refers to the word of God, which is the Bible. You notice also here, brethren, in this text, that it's not the, the godly man, his delight is not something that the blessed man has to do. Did you notice it, church? It is something he loves to do. 